Out of the depth have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice, and let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Happy Sabbath to all those of you connecting wherever you are on God's green earth. May the Lord bless you. Thank you very much for your interest in truth. It is truth alone that sanctifies. If there's anyone listening to us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist, I am particularly happy to welcome you, and I ask God to pour out a very special blessing upon you. I also recognize little children who may be listening. Children pick up a lot more than that for which we give them credit. So little boys, little girls, wherever you are, thank you for loving Jesus, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation. If there's anyone listening who may have contracted the coronavirus, I will pray for you. I have no power, but I know someone who does, and that is God. I will ask God to deliver you 100% from that affliction, and hopefully by the demonstration of that act of mercy in your lives, that will draw you closer to him. Because the Bible says, we love him because he first loved us. Before I get into the message, which is entitled, Practice Makes Perfect, do three little things for me. One, wherever you are, preserve an atmosphere of reverence. The fact that we are on Zoom, on this electronic platform, does not diminish the holiness of God. So wherever you are, whether in the backside of a mountain like Moses at the burning bush or in Solomon's temple at Jerusalem, preserve reverence as we worship the Most High God. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and ask God to put his words in my mouth. This request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, and I really want to speak the words of God. My words cannot save you, but the words of God will change your lives. And favor number three, think as you listen. Thinking is not as automatic as you might suspect. Think, be active as you listen to the words of God. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you, dear God, for the high honor of speaking for you. Forgive me where I've offended you, Father. Enable me through the gift of your spirit. Possess my mind, possess my faculties of speech. I yield myself to you, dear God, 100%. Bless those who are listening. Let the Spirit speaking through me be the Spirit making my words clear to them. Dear God, a special blessing for all our visitors and for all the little children who are watching. If anyone under the sound of my voice has contracted the COVID-19, I ask you, dear God, because you're merciful, and I ask in the name of the great physician Jesus Christ, Heal that person, dear Father, 100%, I pray, because you are a God who does not love suffering. Father, thank you for modern technology that allows us to worship this way. Now, dear God, bless whatever countries are represented by those listening. Bless the leaders. Let them make decisions that are consistent with your word, which says, righteousness exalteth a nation. Hear this humble prayer, Father. I offer it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject, practice makes perfect. Let us go to Jeremiah chapter 13. We'll read verse 23. It is a well-known Bible verse. Jeremiah 13 verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? 
Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Let's read that verse again and we'll read it microscopically and we'll think. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The color of the Ethiopian skin and the spotted nature of the leopard are used to symbolize or represent fixed behaviors. Because the first goes on to say, then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. In other words, those an unconverted person, someone functioning in the flesh, will only do the things of the flesh as verily as a leopard can only be spotted. And so the Bible says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? The answer is no. The spiritual application, can the sinner in his own strength change his or her life? The answer is no. But I have some very good news for you. The same way in this flesh, behaviors cannot be changed by human power. And when I say behaviors, I mean the nature of the person a sinful nature produces sin. A sinner cannot change that. That's what I mean. The same way in the flesh we behave a certain way, so verily in the spirit we behave a different way. Said differently, the same way the flesh produces certain habits of behavior, so does the spirit produce certain habits of behavior. Let us go to uh, Galatians chapter 5. We'll read verses 19 to 21, then we'll read 22 and 23. Our subject, practice makes perfect. In Galatians 5, 19, Paul says, But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Those are the works of the flesh, the carnal nature. Verse 22 and verse 23 tell us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. If you look at those two lists of characteristics and behaviors, you will observe nothing of the flesh is found in the list of spiritual characteristics, and nothing of the spirit is found in the list of behaviors from the flesh. There is nothing spiritual in adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. There is not one iota of the spirit in that list of satanic behaviors. Similarly, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, there is not one iota of the flesh in that list. Jesus said in John chapter 3 verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, by the power of God, the man or the woman walking in the spirit can come to the place and will come to the place where he or she does not express anything that is of the flesh. Because the Bible says, if we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We will do the things of the spirit. This does not happen overnight, but it comes with practice. And I introduced the word practice because our subject is practice makes perfect. Before I move to the next stage of the message, let me pray again. God of heaven and earth, tighten your grip on all that is necessary for me to speak this message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen very carefully to a well-known verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, and by the way, I read from the King James Version of the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I want to pause on for instruction in righteousness. Righteousness is not simply a state of mind. Yes, that is a part of righteousness because the mind produces the behavior. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. But righteousness that is not expressed, it leads one to wonder, is that person truly righteous? Listen again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Righteousness then is something that needs to be taught. And what is taught then needs to be practiced. I pause for you to assimilate that. It's not original to me. It's biblical teaching. What is taught then needs to be practiced. And the Bible says the word of God is profitable for instruction in righteousness. The child of God must be taught how to live a righteous life. The child of God must be taught how to dress like a righteous person, how to eat like a righteous person. The church, the leader, the spiritual leader may not have all the details, but that person is armed with the principles found in the word of God. Righteousness is something that must be taught. But let's go to another verse to help us bolster this argument. As we continue, practice makes perfect. Listen to the great gospel commission. Matthew 28, reading from verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus said, teach them to observe. Teach them to obey. Obey what? Obey the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which the Bible describes as the whole duty of man. And the Bible describes the law of God as righteousness. All thy commandments are righteousness. Instruction in righteousness is instruction in obedience to God. And that which is repeated and repeated becomes a habit. What I'm trying to tell you is right doing should be a habit for the child of God, not an occasional act. Right doing should be a habit as verily as sinful acts do become habits. Teaching them to observe all things. And the most effective teaching is not what happens from a pulpit. It is what happens when the leader comes close to the member, one-to-one, one-on-two, and instructs and tells them, this is how you keep the Sabbath. This is how you do whatever needs to be done. This is instruction in righteousness. Practice, my listening friend, makes perfect, including in the area of right doing. Ellen White has a very interesting quotation, Ministry of Healing, page 491, paragraph 3. The Ministry of Healing, page 491, paragraph 3. That which at first seems difficult, by constant repetition grows easy, and right thoughts and actions become habitual. Righteousness must become a habit in the life of the so-called child of God. Right doing must become, let me use this word, almost a reflexive action, something that occurs instinctively, something that occurs automatically. A little child does not have to be taught how to be selfish. The child emerges from the womb with selfishness in his or her heart. That child has to be taught how to be unselfish. What I'm saying is this, when the person goes through conversion, as surely as the flesh naturally produces selfishness, the spirit naturally produces unselfishness. If the conversion is genuine, 
behavior. Righteousness, to a large degree, is behavior that flows from a righteous mind. And if we repeat it over and over, it becomes a habit. If the way we are by nature, if you slap me, my first instinct is to slap you back. And I don't need to think or pray about it. I will slap you back. Now, if I am truly converted and you slap me, my first instinct is to stay calm, walk away, try to avoid the hostility, behave like Jesus who was slapped and punched and spat in the face. And his instinct was self-restraint because Christ was a truly spiritual being and we are to be like him. Let me say it again. Right doing must become instinctive, automatic reflexive our natural behavior because the thing that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit now there's another reason why we must practice right doing as i said earlier the more you do it the more firmly or the more deeply a, a, an impression is made on the character but it also affects those around us Sinful behavior in a person affects those connected with that person or observing that person. Righteousness affects those connected to that person. And this is more clearly explained by Ellen White. Child guidance, page 201, paragraph 3. But let me pray again. God of heaven and earth, suppress my carnal nature. Let only your glory and the blessing of others be my aim. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen to this quotation, Child Guidance, page 201, paragraph 3. A, a, any course of action is right or wrong, virtuous or vicious, depending on the motive that prompts it. Let me say that again. A course of action, every course of action has a distinct character and importance. It is virtuous or vicious right or wrong according to the motive which prompts it now listen carefully a wrong course of action by frequent repetition leaves a permanent impression upon the mind of the actor the person who does it and also on the mind of those who are connected to him in any relation either spiritual or temporal that's how influence changes people and so a young boy sees a man in his neighborhood behaving a certain way and the young boy is affected and he wants to behave that way let's come into the family a younger boy watches his older brother behave a certain way and he wants to behave that way because the behavior of the older brother is leaving a mark on the young boy who's observing you've often heard the saying i'd rather see a sermon lived a sermon in shoes than a sermon preached from the pulpit and there's 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 no way to argue against that but the effectiveness of a sermon in shoes is that the righteous life impacts observers without the observer's permission i said that clumsily let me try again influence does not seek permission influence just occurs it is up to us to determine will that influence be helpful or will it be harmful but beyond that we have no control you cannot put a, a handcuff on influence and restrict its effect influence does not seek permission therefore it is incumbent upon us to make sure we exert the right influence and we do that by the practicing righteous behaviors which flow from righteous thinking and even the thinking has to be practiced because the mind has to be trained and as you practice an action you learn to do it more effectively and more efficiently until you come to the point where you do it almost without thinking let me explain what i mean many years ago i was in south africa preaching and the local elder of the church was once a professional golfer, a very nice man. And he told me that he would, on some days, practice his golf swing 600 swings in a day. So that when the time came in competition to do that swing, he did not have to think. 
basketball players, whomever, boxers, whomever, you name the athlete, they practice their motions and their movements so often that it almost becomes automatic. And what takes over is muscle memory. The muscle remembers the movement and it is performed without the athlete even thinking. Because the moment you have to think, then it slows you down in that athletic activity. We must apply that spiritually. We are on the very cusp of very, very trying times in this country. And by prophecy, what affects this country will affect the rest of the world. We must come to the place where righteousness, right doing, Christ likeness is our natural instinct. Why? Because we are children of the spirit, not of the flesh. Practice makes perfect and we must learn to practice the art of right doing you know isaiah we're told in isaiah uh, verse 16 where he says cease to do evil learn to do well seek judgment relieve the oppressed plead for the widow judge the fatherless learn to do well the bible says right doing i say is a skill that must be practiced and like anything else, if it is practiced, it becomes a habit. Now, you all know that habits are difficult to break, whether the habit is good or the habit is bad. Habits, once formed, are very, very difficult to break. And God calls upon us to develop the habits of right living, right doing, because as verily as an evil habit is difficult to break, so a righteous habit or a habit of righteous living is difficult to break. And so I go back to our first verse. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may he also do good that are accustomed to do evil. The same way an unconverted person sins naturally, so the genuinely converted person will progress to the point where he or she does what is right naturally. And I give you that Ellen White quotation again, that which at first seems difficult. And for many of us, Right doing is sometimes a challenge, particularly when you're dealing with other people and you think they have no common sense and you have all. It becomes a tremendous challenge. You are more advanced in the church life. Here's someone who just joined the church and you, you need patience with that person. Right doing can be a challenge because it is something into which we grow. But that which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy. The principle practice makes perfect example practice let's assume there are no lockdowns and churches are open and you're accustomed going to church late start practicing attending church on time if you do it for a while getting to church on time will become a habit and you'll become very uneasy with arriving at church late Practice the righteous habit of attending church on time or attending your classroom on time or perhaps going to bed at a certain time or rising a certain time. These habits by practice can become established at a secular level, at a spiritual level. Practice the habit of praying the very first thing you do when God opens your eyes in the morning. Make it a habit Force yourself with the help of the Spirit of God to develop the habit as your eyes open. Immediately, Father, thank you for life. And I recommit that life to your glory. And you do that before your feet hit the ground. Because you can collapse and die between getting from the bed and touching the ground. Make that a habit. Make it a habit all during the day from time to time to recite a passage of scripture the bible is power jesus did everything by the word the entire creation is by the word from time to time during the day recite a bible passage you may develop the habit of at least once every hour say a bible verse even if it's john eleven thirty five, jesus wept you say say a bible verse. develop that habit practice makes perfect jesus practiced righteousness 
But there's something different in the spiritual, different from the carnal, because even a sinner can have some good habits. With the practice of spiritual habits, there is this component called the motivation. Why? Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me, please. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With God, we must answer the question, why? Christ's Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2. Every act is judged by the motive or the motives that prompt it. Let me say it again. Every act is judged or every action by the motives that prompt it. So God needs to know why and the motive for our righteous behavior, our motive for practicing righteous acts must be the glory of God. Now, this is not the case for the unconverted person. The unconverted person can live an upright life in the sense that he or she does not break the laws of the land. I believe most atheists are decent people. But their motive for decency is not the glory of God. But practicing righteousness in the eyes of God, from God's perspective, requires not just the act, but the motivation that drives the act. And for the Christian, that motive must be the glory of God. The Bible tells us that. 1 Corinthians 10.31 1 Corinthians 10.31 this is a verse that has nothing symbolic about it. It is 100% literal. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Do means practice, do means carry out, do means act. Whether therefore ye eat, that's doing something, or drink, that's doing something, or anything else you do, or pursue a romantic relationship, or apply for some academic program, or decide to move from Michigan to Wisconsin, or whatever. Whatever you do, says God to his child, your motive must be my glory. This is what separates the practice of right doing in the child of God from the unbeliever who can do what's right in the eyes of the world. The quality and character of an act is based on the motive that even in secular affairs, if someone, if a murder is investigated, one of the first things the investigators want to uncover is the motive. That will determine whether it's murder or manslaughter, first degree, second degree, third degree. The motive, the motive will affect the severity of the punishment. He did not intend to kill. He came to rob. But in fighting the owner of the house to get away, he accidentally killed him. That's not first degree murder. His motive was not. Well, if human beings can emphasize motive, what about God? So right doing for the child of God must be driven by the right motive. And I say again, that motive must be for the glory of God. Listen to Jesus Christ in John chapter 8, verse 29. And he that hath sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. The motive that drove Christ was the glory of the Father. And Jesus, by his own testimony, he declares in John 17, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. Why? Because the, the, the glory of the Father was the first thing and the primary thing that drove the behavior of Jesus, the glory of the Father, even in his most trying time. And his most trying time was not the cross. It was Gethsemane because there were two other men on the cross suffering the same thing. In Gethsemane was his most trying time. And he prayed, he prayed Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Why should I be careful with my diet, which is an act of right doing? For the glory of God. Why should I be careful how I dress? For the glory of God. Because my behavior will affect someone watching me and God will not take it lightly if my influence takes someone downward. Practice makes perfect. Let's practice right doing. But to do that in a way that pleases God, we must be of the spirit and not of the flesh. 
if we walk in the spirit, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Galatians 6, uh, 5, 16. Walk in the spirit, live in the spirit, practice that life with the power of the same spirit and you and I will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Practice makes perfect. My appeal to you listening to me, regardless of your age, little children, practice obeying your parents and you will develop a habit of obedience. My little brother, practice being kind to your little sister and it will become a habit. My older brother, my older sister in college, practice doing your assignments on time. Practice getting to class on time. And regardless of your age, practice studying the Word of God as an indispensable daily activity. Practice pausing any odd time during the day to pray to God. Make this a habit, practice it, and it will become established. And you'll find yourself praying naturally, praying automatically. It will become your instinctive behavior. When I was a little boy, I loved cats, still love them. And we had cats in the house. And from time to time, we'd see mice. I distinctly remember holding one of my cats. And a, mice, a mouse ran by, and the entire body of the cat stiffened. Because the cat reacted instinctively to the sight of a mouse. He wanted to chase it, but I was holding him, and the entire body of that cat stiffened muscular reaction to the sight of a mouse. Ah, we can do that spiritually. We can have a stiffening of the muscles in the presence of sin. We can react, behave, respond, reply instinctively because we have developed the habit of right doing. And so I say again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Teach your children to behave righteously. Church leaders, teach the members to behave righteously. Wherever you are, teach and of course yourself practice. That goes for you, for me. Let us practice right doing. Because practice makes perfect. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the common sense of scripture. Come coupled with the power of the spirit of truth. Father, where we have failed to develop righteous habits, forgive us. Change our minds even now. Change our hearts, I pray. And plant within us a desire to practice righteousness, driven by the right motive, your glory. Where we failed you, forgive us, dear God, and forget what we've done to you. Give us grace today. Bless everyone who listened, every man, woman, boy, and girl, particularly our guests and the little children. Again, I ask you to heal anyone who may have contracted the coronavirus. Heal that person, dear God, please, for your glory, and that person may become a witness of your goodness. Hear this humble prayer. Keep us faithful. Save us when you come, when we shall live in a world of which the Bible says, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.